So now we're going to have our next talk from uh, Matt Kendall. Matt is a clinical hypnotherapist and IENT practitioner and trainer. He has spent the past nine years researching memory, how it works, and how it can be altered. Having studied under a range of trainers, Matt has his own unique approach, approach towards therapy and chain work. Matt is a regular talk radio as well as podcast and live stream interviews. His main focus is helping people recover from traumatic experiences and dealing with social anxiety. So big warm welcome to Matt and let's get started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Niall. Thank you. We all good? You can all hear me okay? Fabulous. As he goes out the room already, I just want to say a massive thank you to Niall. I know he's run off. It was also his birthday this week. Uh, to get, we're not going to sing. Uh, to get 200 people in a room like this takes a huge amount of effort. So I want to say thank you to Niall. Um, and for organising this. You all having fun so far? Yes. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to ruin that for you. Okay. So <laughs> I will give you these links at the end. I want to send you all of these slides. We're going to be covering a lot of content, including the exercises. Okay. So, the ethical question, the morality, is should you remove negative memories? Now, this was recently discussed and debated on TV by the leading, brightest minds of the industry, by the thought leaders, by the visionaries, by the top minds. This was discussed on Loose Women, okay? <laughs> Not only was it discussed on Loose Women, I was discussed on Loose Women. Without me being contacted prior, I started getting phone calls. One day, I was just at home being fabulous. And I started getting phone calls and texts from family members and friends going, do you know that you're on Loose Women? Which I thought was a bit of an accusation. And I was like... <laughs> and I thought, this is highly embarrassing, finding out my friends and family watch Loose Women. But I went on and I found this clip. It's Loose Women featuring Gok Wan. ...and bad experiences that you've yeah. had in your life. And you have a unique take on it and that you, you say, well, thank you to, to the people who treated you badly in your life. Um, a, a scientist, he's a hypnotherapist, sorry, it's not a scientist, he's a hypnotherapist, has said <laughs> that you, there are certain techniques you can use to erase right. bad memories. And we were talking earlier before the show about whether we thought this was a good idea or not. Would... Mm. So that went out without them asking me, but I've got some value out of that clip, don't worry. Um, so basically, they didn't look too positive about the idea of removing negative... Well, you can't tell so much Botox in their faces, but I think, overall, they were very negative about removing negative memories because they seem to think if you remove a negative memory, you somehow lose your identity, you lose who you are, and you don't know what's kind of going on, almost like eternal sunshine in the spotless mind. You forget a relationship, whatever it might be. That's not true. This talk shouldn't be called erasing negative memories. It should be called readdressing negative memories and having a better response to them. But it's not as sexy. But so I'm going to show you the aim of today's talk. For those who are new to NLP, CBT, and hypnotherapy and change work, I want to show you a little bit about how memory works and, more importantly, how it can be altered. For those with a psychological background, I want to give you a different perspective on bilateral stimulation techniques and cognitive reprocessing. So what we're going to be covering. So we're going to be covering what the different memory types are common myths and misunderstandings, how experience creates belief systems, how problems, and basically how memories cause problems in present day, mind tricks, how your mind messes you up, memory with time perception, changing the structure of memories, reducing panic, and IEMT to remove memories. That's a lot in it. Let's go on with it. So my background, I first came across this when, uh, 2002, I met a hypnotherapist, and basically he... Offered to, he offered to hypnotise me for £10, which uh, we did. And he, he basically said, I think you should train to be a hypnotherapist. I said, OK. So I went and trained with lots of different institutions. And in 2007, I came across IEMT. So my client work now, I specialise in social anxiety. I help people to recover from trauma. And I, I help people remove past negative experiences to give them control over the present. My main focus now is working with therapists and coaches and training them in this process, which I do called IEMT. So why do I do these? Because people are in pain and they don't actually have to be. By learning to apply these techniques, it can radically improve the quality of your life and the quality of people's life around you. And it puts you in a position of control. So this is how memory kind of breaks down. We have memory here, short and long-term memory. We're going to be dealing with long-term memory today. And this is how that sort of breaks down even further. So just to give you sort of a description, procedural memory is the part of memory Knowing how to do things is basically motor skills. It's procedural. 
This information contains things like walking, talking, riding a bike. You can't consciously recall this type of memory. Semantic memory refers to a portion of long-term memory, basically from personal experience, uh, from not drawn from personal experience, such as knowledge of colours, sounds of letters, these kinds of things. You can recall these, but there's no emotional connection. And episodic memory, which we'll be going to focus on today, is these are things like autobiographical events. I'm like this because of what happened to me. So these are contextual, who, why, where, when, what. It's the collection of past personal experiences that occur at a particular time and place. Now, these memories can be consciously recalled, and you have an emotional connection to them. This is what we're going to be focusing on, these types of memories. So you're not going to walk out of here not knowing how to walk or speak or breathe, okay? Because that'd be, that'd be silly. But this is basically how belief systems are actually created. So some common myths that we record everything like a black box recorder. We simply don't, and black box recorders are red. Um, the memory is factually correct. No, it's not. Uh, I don't know how they got these stats, but your eyes do 10% of the seeing, the rest is made up in the brain. And that traumatizing memories cannot be changed. They, they, they can. They certainly can. And I want to show you today certain techniques to do this. I've worked with a lot of people who've come back from conflict, come back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and they've been in schools where they've seen children hung from the rafters, these kind of things. Things which they think are burnt into their retinas, which they can't remove, they can be. So why do we actually have memory? Well, essentially, it's to keep us alive and away from danger. We remember what we've learned, especially if it's a threat to our safety. And the brain is a streamlined processor. So that means without remembering and learning, it's just too much information to process every single day. Now, when we are developing in our early years, our formative years, as we call it, between about 4 and 12, we experience situations both directly and indirectly. A direct experience is if you are being bullied, the bully is happening to you. Indirectly is watching somebody being bullied. So, but we still take it on as our own. So a lot of social anxiety work and stuff I do at the moment, it's not because the child, they were hit as a child, it's because they watched their father hit their mother. So it's not actually happening to them, it's happening around them. But people still take it on as themselves. And this lays the basis of our beliefs and our character. So a belief system, we have something in the middle called the ISC, which is the initial sensitizing event. This is the first time something happens, the initial sensitizing event. We then have compounding experience around it, and this actually creates the belief. It's very much like if you go into a shop, you go into like Zara or Topman or something, and you're going to buy a new jacket or a jumper, and you think, oh, I like that jacket, it looks nice. And then you go out, and you see it everywhere. They were always there, you just weren't looking for it. Same happens with experience. If you get told you're ugly or you're useless or you're stupid by somebody, especially an authority, a teacher or a parent or someone you care about, you'll then be looking for basically information that matches that. Now we have stimulus. We have these, these beliefs that are then stimulated in modern day. And we have predictable outcomes that are from this. Thoughts, gut reaction, feelings, Avoidance and anxiety. So our life is created with a certain amount of belief systems that we avoid rupturing. So you have freedom over life as long as you go like this. Mm. Mm, shit, no. Yay, free will. Okay. <laughs> We construct our lives to actively avoid rupturing these things, to avoid stimulating them. If you want real free will over life, you'd be able to do that. Now, a lot of the self-help industry, which I despise on a very big level, which is weird because I run the biggest self-development meetup group in the world, but I hate self-help, um, tries to get you to power through this. Smash your beliefs. Walk on hot coals in a hotel car park like that'll help something. I hate Tony Robbins. Mm. Did that was recording, aren't we? Uh, I hate Tony Robbins. <laughs> I really do. And Ty Lopez. Okay, so what you learnt as a child, he's an arsehole, what you learnt as a child might be relevant when you were young, but it's not so much relevant now because the thing is, memory is coded at the time of exposure. So basically, if you experience something as a four year old, you remember it as a four year old. So you want to do something now, but you get a gut reaction, although you know it's nonsense. And we call these irrational fears or cognitive dissonance, two opposing thoughts. It might be, I want to go talk to that person. <laughs> gut reaction. 
You have all these thoughts, all this anxiety, and you don't talk to them, and you go, well, they looked awful anyway, or they, they wouldn't have liked me. So you actually, it's to make you feel okay. You justify why you didn't do it, which is frustrating, and it causes what's wrong with me. What's wrong? I should be able to do this. It's simple. Now, frustration, if not dealt with, can, can lead to depression. I'm not saying it always does, but it can. So let's just take public speaking. Now, I'm weird. I quite like public speaking. Apparently, it's the most frightening thing in the world to do. It's all right. So let's say you're at work one day and your boss says you're going to give a talk. Looks like he's been fired, to be perfectly honest. But say you're, you are giving a presentation. But well, what's happened? Your brain automatically does something what we call a transderivational search. It searches your mind to what it knows about public speaking. And it'll bring up, so we have him in the middle, having a minor breakdown, and all this stuff going on. So, oh, a microphone, and maybe a boy, maybe him speaking, or a kid speaking. A lectern, and Adele, just because she gets anxious. And so you have all this stuff which is brought up around public speaking. So what are some solutions to this problem? Well, you can do counselling to try and understand the issue. That's certainly one way. You can do CBT, which is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, to try and interpret or reinterpret what's actually being processed. You can do exposure, st exposure therapy to the stimuli. Now, exposure therapy, not fun. So say that you have a problem with dogs, right? You don't like dogs. You start off in a park, maybe not a park, there'll be a lot of dogs. You'll start off somewhere, and there'll be a dog really far away. And you'll go, I'm okay here. You take a step, I'm okay here. And you keep going until you get to the dog, and you're no longer scared. It takes a long time, and you can re-traumatise. <laughs> Alcohol and Drugs for Courage, the London special. <laughs> like you happen. Okay. <laughs> And intervention work, such as NLP, hypnosis, and IMT, which I'll be talking about later. And training in the skill set. A lot of people forget you need to train in something. Um, a lot of nonsense these days is all about mindset. Oh, I'd start a business, or I'd do this thing if I had the right mindset. No. Learn how to do it. Mindset without skill set makes for a happy idiot. A lot of the time, honestly, you need to learn how to do something. I just want to be confident. Shut up. <laughs> I'm quite cocky and sarcastic. I know that we've got professors speaking here. I'm the person in the middle. I'm not a professor. Okay, so are we going to look at some mind tricks. I want to see, is seeing really believing? If we see things, do we see them correctly? Or if we see things differently? And we're basically, what you're seeing is not what's there. It's your experience of it. I'm not going to get into it today. But the world doesn't exist the way you think. It only exists in your head, but that's for a different day. So let's look at some things here, Okay. Now, who sees a nudie lady? Everybody. <laughs> if you show this to children, do you know what they see? Two dancing stick men. Ah! We found your level. We found your level. It's two dancing stick men. See? <laughs> okay, so you don't see. <laughs> you sometimes see what you believe. Relax, it's just eggshells. <laughs> Now, this one is my favourite. Just by a show of hands, who's seen the girl rotating clockwise? Hmm, not everybody. Who's seen it anti-clockwise? Oh. If you look at it long enough, and if you realise it's going both ways, you can mentally change it to go the other way. It's weird. If you move your head back and forwards a little bit, it also does it. And sometimes it flips. And I was doing it last night in bed. I was like, boo, this is really weird. Because when I, I live with Alex at the back, and I showed him, I said, which way is it turned? He goes, clockwise. I said, it's obviously anti-clockwise. And I was thinking, what's clockwise? But it's basically, it's at the moment what hemisphere is most dominant at this moment in time. It's weird, isn't it? So how does memory relate to time and how we observe time? Well, is time moving more quickly? That's what we all seem to be thinking. There are several theories about this and how memory is related into time and how time seems to be going more quickly. It's the end of February. How? What? Why? How is this? Now, David Icke, I will be using different sources today. 
David Icke says that we are living in a vortex controlled by our reptilian overlords and it's simply speeding up. That's theory one. Number two, that we review time at certain points of a year and we see that as a percentage of our life. We usually review a year at two very specific times. New Year's and your birthday. Okay? What have I done this year? What have I done? Oh. It's gone quick, I know that. And the way that works, I'll explain a bit. And the other thing, I think it's more to do with simply creating less long-term memory. So, it's time moving more quickly because these things are now 20 years old. Hit me baby one more time by, how's that? She's only 20. <laughs> Unbot by Hanson. Everybody's Back by Backstreet Boys. I'll Be Missing You by Puff Daddy. And Around the World by Daft Punk is 20 years old. I mean, I like it. So, feel old yet? Buzzfeed. So, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is doing a reboot. I told this to my 14-year-old nephew. He goes, what's the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? I hate him. So, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is doing... He's only 14. He's doing a reboot. When it starts filming later this year, Will Smith will be older than Uncle Phil from the original series. Hmm. <laughs> so, how does this work? How does memory relate into time? Well... When you are 10, one year is 10% of your life. When you are 50, one year is 2% of your life. So therefore, it makes sense that if you review your life, it's a smaller percentage. Therefore, it seems to be going faster. And we've been using this for a long time, but there's more studies and stuff coming out at the moment which actually says that might be the case. It's also quite likely to be the amount of long-term memories created within a specific unit of time. So what I mean by this is creating a long-term memory is a chemical process. They are more likely to occur where there's high levels of emotion and something of novelty value. Novelty value simply means something different than the norm. Some examples are your wedding day, being mugged, getting a job, being fired, losing your virginity, first time. This is not all the same day, okay? This is spread out. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Going on holiday. So let's say you do a normal job in London. You go to there every day and, or most days and have fun. And then one day you go on holiday. Well, you're doing a lot of stuff when you're going on holiday. You're booking it. You're packing it. You're traveling to the airport. You're going through security, buying all your fags, flying out there, arriving at the airport, getting to your hotel, unpacking, then getting on the booze. So you have all these different things happening. The way to see this is like this. If we have a unit of time, say a day, the yellow dots represent a long-term memory. If you want your time to seem longer, we have to do this. I know the animation is amazing. We have to create more long-term memories within a specific unit of time. When you're young, you're out and learning and experiencing the world. When you're older and more mature, Weeks are very samey. They're very samey. Like, who remembers how they got here? I don't. It's a Sunday. I don't remember anything about Sundays anyway. But it was like, because we do things automatically. It's being processed by that procedural memory. We're not creating long-term memory. So when you review a year, if you've not done much, it's going to seem like it's gone faster. Now, the Mandela effect is also something effective memory. Has everyone heard of this? Just by show of hands. So a few people. The Mandela effect is very big on the internet, so it's true. <laughs> There's a certain amount of people in America, and what's good about America, you can say in America and say anything. In America, they believe the past is being changed somehow. There are people who remember watching Nelson Mandela's funeral when he was in prison. Now, over here, people are thinking, but that didn't happen because Nelson Mandela was freed from prison and went on to become president and then died in 2013. Some people think he died in the 80s, 1980s. I don't know why, but they can remember watching the funeral. Star Wars, so people misremember things, essentially. Luke, I am your father. The actual line was? Anyone? No, I am your father. That's the actual line, but it's misquoted. And Tom Cruise from Risky Business. Everyone remembers him dancing in his sunglasses. He never wore his sunglasses to do the dance. 
So what causes this? According to the internet, number one, time travellers are coming back and altering the past. Number two, parallel universes and quantum leaping. Or number three, basically we're just remembering things differently. We're incorrectly remembering the past. And this is what happens. We're just doing this on a larger scale. These things, this Mandela effect, just seem to be examples of where more than one person misremembers something. Our memory is not true. So what does all this actually mean? If our memories are not accurate, and if people are who they are because of their memories, then we can consciously access those life-defining memories and moments and reprocess them which allows us to make decisions in the present based on the information in front of us and not the emotional experiences of the past. That's the freedom that you could have. Saying, I'm like this because of X, you can begin to change and alter. I'm not here to fill you full of confidence. I'm here to help you remove these past negative experiences which have been causing you to act and think and make decisions in a certain way. I'm going to be able to give you more freedom over making those decisions. OK? Yeah. Cool. Two people agree. <laughs> so does everybody have problems? Yes. The ones that say no, watch them. <laughs> everybody has problems, OK? But you are usually 180 degrees out to where your problems are, to where you think. So from my experience, people who live in the past, when I say people who live in the past, I mean those people, I know, functions, who go to therapy, to therapy, to therapy, to therapy, they just want to be fixed. And when they'll be fixed, they'll get on with their lives, right? I have these a lot. I've, I've tried this therapy and this therapy and this therapy and this, and they all didn't work. What's the common denominator? I tried every diet, it didn't work. Really? Did you? Right. Now, some people are living like this. If you ask these people about their future plans, their career plans, their pension, they will not tend to have any future plans. They're trying to fix themselves. They're not creating a future. There are those people who live in the future, the goal setters, the, like the proper mental goal setters, the, the people who think they have a Ferrari because they've imagined it and using the law of attraction, like the really delusional people. They've usually got a lot of problems in the past. And then you've got people who are trying to be present, and they're the most annoying of all. <laughs> they are all escapism from their memory or their, basic, their internal workings. It's all escapism. So I believe that good mental health is a combination to actively work on past negative memories and experiences, while constantly adding new long-term memories, create and act on future plans, and carefully monitor yourself so you can measure the changes. And I believe that's a really good recipe for dealing with yourself. So what is a memory? Well, it has two, well, especially the memories, the episodic memories which we're working on today. A memory has two major components that we're going to be focusing on. The kinesthetics and the information. We're not going to be talking about the narrative. The narrative is what actually happened. So kinesthetic simply means feeling. There's actually two types of kinesthetic. We're going to be working with the, what I call the internal kinesthetic. There's an external as well. The internal kinesthetic is when you think of a memory, how much emotion are you feeling now? Because there's another type of feeling, is what you think and feel about the memory. But what you feel about the memory and what you experience in the memory are two different things. Make sense? Yes. So we're going to be looking at what it's like when you're actually thinking of the memory. The information is what we call submodalities, and they break down to a lot of things like this. Is it black or white? Is it a picture? Is it 2D? Is it 3D? Is it from your perspective? Does it have any sound? So all of the ingredients of the memory are the submodalities. We simply rate the feelings, the kinesthetic, we rate that out of 10. We're not going to talk about what the feelings are, anger, shame, whatever, no. Just when you're accessing this memory now, out of 10, how strong is it? So we're going to do an exercise. I want you to work with somebody, and I say, do you have a negative memory? And they'll go, yes, because I'm prepared. And you'll go, you'll ask them, is it a picture or is it a movie? Let me really be very sort of clear on this, OK? When you close your eyes and access a memory, if it stays still, 
It's a picture. <laughs> if when you access the memory, it moves, it's a movie. <laughs> People get very confused over this. But it's like a picture that moves. Right. Or it's like a movie, but it stays still. OK. Now, some people go, it's like several pictures. OK, just fine. But basically, is it a picture or is it a movie? Does it have sound? Is it subjective or objective? Subjective means it's like seeing it like you are there through your perspective. It's like you're there seeing it through your own eyes. Objective means just from any other angle. You could be seeing yourself, you might not be. So basically, rather than subject or objective, are you seeing it through your own eyes or not? Is it in focus? And out of 10, how strong is the emotion? So let me just go through this again. Say to somebody, do you have a memory, a negative memory? And they'll go, yes. So I'm prepared. Is it a picture or is it a movie? Does it have any sound? Is it subjective or objective? Is it in focus? And out of 10, how strong is it as you're accessing the memory now? Now, before we get going on this, there's 200 of you and one of me, and that's not a fair fight. So I have a microphone, which isn't really that loud. So when I put my hand up, please also put your hand up and also be quiet and tell those around you, because we've got a lot to get through today. Does that make sense? Fabulous. You have two minutes either way. Make friends with the person next to you. Go, 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 go. So hopefully you'll know somebody next to you, and you'll have some information about a memory which they have. Before you start doing any form of therapy or change work, you need to have a way of calibrating and monitoring yourself to know if you're getting better. A lot of people go to therapy, to therapy, are you fixed yet? I, I don't know. I've got no way of monitoring it. The best thing to do is to monitor what's actually going on. Okay? So this is what we do. We start to monitor what the memories are actually like. So the second part of the exercise, we're going to change the submodalities. So if it's a picture, make it into a movie. How? By, sorry, it's still me. Um, I sometimes do a girl's voice, but where's Matt gone? I'm still here. So but how do we do it? Well, you use your imagination. How do I make it still? You, you, you're using your imagination anyway, so you might as well actually take control of it. So if, does it have sound? If so, make it quieter. If it doesn't have sound, give it sound. Make sure the sound's appropriate to the scene that you're in. Right, so if you're by a river, don't give it a fairground sound, because that makes no sense, right? So actually make sure you give it appropriate sounds. If it's subjective, make it objective. If it's objective, make it subjective. If it's in focus, try and move it away. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to just play around with these. There's no particular order and there's no outcome. I do not want you to lower or change the emotion. What I want you to do is I want you to change these aspects, the submodalities, and observe the effect on the emotion. So if someone has a picture, make it a movie. Does that make it go up or down? OK, keep it back, put it back to what it was. OK, if it's subjective, make it objective. If it's close, make it further away. If it's sound, make it loud, make it quiet. What effect does it have on the emotion? Does that make sense? OK, you're going to have about two, three minutes either way with the person next to you. Go, go, go. OK, guys, how do we find that? Good? So basically, what we tend to find is if your memory is a movie associated to seeing like you're there, Bright, close, and with sound, it's going to have a much higher emotional impact than if it's further away, objective, small without sound. This, you can start doing this right away. You can start doing And the emotional impact change can be massive. Hello? No, it's open. OK, so, so do you see how you can start to take control of this? You don't need to be the subject of these negative memories. You can start to take control. This is just step one. I'm going to show you how to do this automatically with IMT. So ruminating memories. Ruminating memories are fun. Ruminating memories are just waiting there for when you're feeling bad about your life. They tend to be about decisions which you did or did not make. To make it easier, you have no free will, so you didn't actually make that decision anyway, but that's a different day. <laughs> so basically, it's usually about leaving a partner getting with a partner, leaving a job, doing something. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the, 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 the luxury of going back to see what happens if we made the other decision, which was Tony Blair's excuse with Iraq. But you don't have the opportunity to go back and see what happens. There is no such thing as good and bad decisions. There are just decisions, and you make them good or bad. But there's no good or bad decisions, but we ruminate on them. 
What if I did this? What if I did that? What if they don't help. And what happens is it starts here. Basically, emotion, time, starts here. So you're feeling bad about your life. You've just been on Facebook and seen your perfect friends. It builds up. Oh, boom. Then you drop out of it. And just because your brain hates you, we go back to the beginning, just ready for when you're feeling bad again. <laughs> Handy. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to create an exit from these memories. So we have a loop, and basically what we tend to do is we go internal. We start to think internally, and it starts to spread out, causes anxiety, all different kinds of problems. The only place this problem exists is in your head. So we need to create an exit. So at the moment... Our ruminating memory is circular. It starts and finishes at the same time. We need to create an exit. Now you're thinking, Matt, I spent quite a lot of money on these tickets today. Where does that money go? I've hired the best designers and animators in London. <laughs> Hold your applause. This is a big build-up. We're going to go from this to this, OK? <laughs> That's what we need to create. And we do this by adding time, content, and information into the original memory. So with a partner, you're going to ask them, do you have a, do you have a memory which you ruminate on? Then ask them what happened afterwards. Don't do the thing where you made a bad decision and then all the other things you say are just consequences of that, because that'll just make you feel awful. It doesn't matter what the information is. It just needs to be extra content. So keep adding time and content until you reach the present day. Then ask them, when they think of the memory now, what's it like? So it looks like this, all right? So if something happened, I do about six of these jumps, six of these jumps. So I worked with a girl recently who'd had a really bad first date. Like a really, it was her first date since her breaking up with her husband. And so she decided to go on this first date, and it was absolutely awful. They went out somewhere really nice, I believe it was Nando's. And uh, true story. And uh, it didn't go well. It didn't go well. So I said to you, what, well, what happened the next day? She goes, oh, uh, I went back to work. Well, what happened the next week? Oh, I went to go stay with my family. Oh, cool. Well, what that next month? Oh, I went on holiday with my friends. Cool. What happened later on that year? Well, I moved and I got a new job. And what did you do this week? I've been out with friends, I've been meeting people, I've had a good time. Cool. When you think about that memory now, what's it like? Yeah, it's not as bad. Excellent. I'm not looking for you to feel good about stuff. My job is to make your life less shit. <laughs> it really is. I'm not here to give you confidence, I'm here to make things less bad. Because when your life is less bad, you don't have to feel confident. Wanting to feel confident and powerful is, comes from absolute insecurity. It really does. Got deep there for a minute. <laughs> so with the person next to you, go, do you have a decision or a memory that you ruminate on? And they'll go, yes. Because if not, we're all right. You go, yes, I do. OK. Don't go into too much personal detail with this, of course, but say, OK, well, what happened? So if it's something that happened last week, you can ask them what happened basically every day since. And if you don't know what it is, make it up. It doesn't matter. You're just adding stuff in. It's like ruining a recipe, really. And keep coming through till today. If it's something that happened 10 years ago, what happened the day after? What's likely to have happened? What would have happened the next week? The next month, the next year, a few years later, a few years later, what's happened this week? So do about six of these jumps. Ask them now and then say, when you think about the original memory now, what's it like? And just see the emotional impact it has. Does that make sense? Fabulous. You have two or three minutes either way. Go, 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 go. OK, how did we find that? Good? Cool. My aim today is to give you a range of tools and techniques. It's to give you a range of tools and techniques, because some things might work on some things that might not. Well, you've got something else, all right? It's not one fix all. It's not tapping, which works for everything, apparently, which doesn't. <laughs> Meridians. Right. So changing memory, every time you access a memory, it slightly changes it, all right? We're, yeah, we're kind of busy in here, or are you coming in? Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Apologies. That's okay, no worries. Right, so <laughs> the mood or impact or state, 
To be fair, I do have the door open. In fact, I'll close the door. We're not quite TED Talks, are we? Right, okay. The mood or state that you're in when you access it will have a large impact upon the memory. By adding time in and or content, it changes how we access it, like scratching a CD. I told this to my 14-year-old nephew, and he said to me, what's a CD? I hate him. <laughs> he said, is that like Apple Music? <laughs> right. One simple trick you can do is to hold a negative memory and simply start moving, dancing, or doing anything. But well, the important thing is to hold the memory whilst you do it. So panic attacks, these are always fun. We often experience negativity, uh, negative memory or anxiety when we're out, so that's the worst. And these can spiral into panic attacks. I've had several. I had one in Sainsbury's once. It was Christmas, and James Corden was on. It was awful. <laughs> True story. I'd had two coffees beforehand. And people start to worry about having panic attacks, and that feeds the problem itself. I have panic about having panic attacks. Ooh, not good. So how can we reduce panic? Well, first thing we can do is mindfulness. And it really does work. Now, mindfulness is about a redirection of attention from the internal to the external. And you do this by simply saying what's around you. So if I was here, I'd be like, table, lady, pen, cup, man. I'd start by saying what's around me. Now, my clients will often say, if I'm out and about in London, I can't simply start saying what's around me. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> In London, you have to be really freaky to get any form of attention. So you can start saying this, and no one will care, I assure you. So we're bringing our attention outwards. Basically, anxiety is a left hemispheric phenomenon, which feeds off itself. So we're bringing it outwards. Other things to do is create physical sensations. Simply rubbing your feet and your toes can really help. Daily exercise, reducing caffeine and less screen time. So I see a lot of clients who have anxiety. Uh, why are you anxious? Well, I don't really sleep. I stay up playing computer games till four or five in the morning. I love doing coke. I drink loads of coffee and Red Bull. And yeah, I just want to be more confident in life. <laughs> and what do you think is causing this? <laughs> so the best way to do this is to actually reduce your lifestyle. Well, not reduce your lifestyle, but looking at your lifestyle and begin to reduce the panic in it. And one thing is a breathing technique. Now, there are breathing techniques like the four, six, eight. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm doing breathing techniques, it makes me anxious. And so I like to do this thing where you just excel all the air out of your lungs and then breathe in. It just works best. So let's start by looking at the brain. So that's a brain. We have a left and a right hemisphere, basically a left and a right side. Now, we know pretty much what the left hemisphere is responsible for and what the right hemisphere is responsible for. So the left hemisphere is responsible for stuff like speech, logic, spatial awareness, simple maths, the here and now, willpower, short-term memory. In hypnosis, we, definitely, we used to call it, or we still call it, the conscious mind. In the subconscious mind, or the right hemisphere, it's singing. So although speaking is left hemispheric, singing's right hemispheric. You know when you see people on X Factor, and they come up and they're like, and they're stammering, they can't, then they can actually, well, they can't actually sing, but they do sing, right? It's because that's a right hemispheric um, function. Abstract thinking, connection, emotions, it's your character, it's routine behavior, it's long term memory, and your subconscious mind. Hypnosis works like this you get people into a trance, you then go into the subconscious mind, do the change, come to the conscious mind, and exit. So you go into the conscious, do what's called an induction and a deepener, change the thing, come back out, awaken them and exit. Now we have a bunch of, <coughs> excuse me, we have a bunch of fibres in the middle. God, I'm dying, one second. <coughs> oh, I'm not dying, nice. So we have a bunch of fibres in the middle called a corpus callosum. Basically the connection between the two hemispheres, a small bunch of fibres. Einstein had a very large corpus callosum. People think he had a large brain. He actually had a large corpus callosum, which is the fibres that connected the two hemispheres up together. So therapy and change work are very different. So I do change work. I do not do therapy. With therapy, you cannot therapy your way out of a problem, I find. It also takes action. You have to actually do stuff as well. And often counselling and talking therapy will fail because it's left hemispheric. And I'll show you. Basically, if you're just talking about a problem, it's left hemispheric. And what happens, at some point in the session, it'll go to the other hemisphere. Basically, we'll start crying. Then you can't talk. And then you come back, and you're able to talk about it. And that's how a lot of sessions go. 
And people can find it easier to express pain through art and music and singing rather than speaking about it, simply because that's all one side and speaking's on the other. So it's hard to speak about your problems, but you can do some art to express it. Talking about issues can also re-traumatise you. I'm going to see another therapist to talk about that time I got stabbed. Oh, great. So how IEMT works? IEMT works in a slightly different way. So IEMT stands for Integral Eye Movement Therapy. And it works on getting the hemispheres to communicate with each other, which we call bilateral stimulation. Bi, two, lateral, next to each other, stimulation, get them to do something. By getting someone to locate the negative memory in the long-term memory in the right hemisphere and then engaging the left hemisphere at the same time, we get to actually process this memory from the present by introducing time orientation and logic into an emotional problem. And it changes perception. So memory is encoded at the time of exposure and it doesn't age. Now my favourite film growing up was Terminator 2. Show my age. And the thing is, when I think about Terminator 2, I don't think about me watching it now. I think about a 13-year-old boy watching it. Me, the 13-year-old boy there, right? So I think about me watching it as a 13-year-old boy. I watched it again recently, and it seemed really rubbish. Now, that's not changed. I have changed. When you change the way you perceive something, the thing you're perceiving changes. So that when you change the way you perceive something, the thing you're perceiving changes. So that's me. Look, when I'm 13, I had hair. I'm not these. I didn't change that much. Look, Terminator 2 going on. I had two older sisters until I was 13. I thought it was called Amy, to be fair. They wanted another sister. So how we begin to change perceptions using IEMT. IMT allows the client to observe these life-defining moments, the memories we talked about at the beginning, these episodic memories, from a perspective of who they are today. Seeing these memories from where you are allows you to see the memory, basically allows these memories to be processed in a similar way that what happens during REM. We're doing a lot of investigation on this, the association of IMT, to what's happening neurologically. I can't give you a definite answer to what's happening neurologically. We have theories, we have ideas of how it works. I'm going to do something, I'm going to show you how it works, which I think is more important. And basically, we are trying to actually work out exactly why it works. It works very similar to EMDR, which some of you may have heard of. It's a much faster process than EMDR, to be honest. And a lot of the therapists who do my course have done EMDR as well. So basically, um, it basically begins to process where you are from now. And the emotional connection, the significance to who you are, the visual recall, that's what you can see, the emotion diminish automatically. So we use the eyes to access the brain. Our eyes are connected directly to the brain. And we use the eyes to actually tell what's happening internally. We don't have time to go into the actual calibration of how this works today. Like I say, it's usually a two-day thing. But basically, when you think of a memory, you literally locate it with your eyes. You actually locate it. By holding that memory and moving the eyes, it actually causes what we call bilateral stimulation. And that is the process that actually helps th this, this process. So we're actually using a natural process of REM, but consciously on memories that we're specifically locating. So we're not doing anything unnatural. A lot of coaching and therapy is trying to change something in a natural way. By doing this, we're actually pro we're using how the brain processes memory anyway, but instead of just letting it do it on that day, we're actually going back and finding these life-defining memories and doing it that way instead. So what we're going to do with a partner, we're going to ask them if they have a negative memory, and they're going to go, yes, we do. And I want you to give it a label, the schoolyard, like just two or three words. The schoolyard or Mark's house, don't know what Mark's done, but Mark's house or something like that. Because you're going to keep saying it to that person, keep thinking of Mark's house, keep thinking of Mark's house, as you're moving the eyes. I want you to ask them if it's a picture or a movement. I want you to write this down. I want you to write this down as well. We are going to call this memory one, because we're going to come back and check this later, because it's going to be freaky. I want you to get them a label for the schoolyard, whatever it might be. Ask them if it's a picture or a movie. Is it subjective or is it objective? Ask them how clear and in focus it is. And out of 10, how strong is the emotion? So ask somebody if they have a negative memory. Ask them for a, a label. Ask them if it's a picture or a movie, subjective or objective, how clear and focuses, and out of 10, how strong is the emotion. 
If it's about a period of time, go for a particular memory, a specific memory. I'll give you an example. <laughs> All the examples I give you today, I have the express permission of my clients to do so. So this guy came to see me, he goes, I'm having a, long, a hard time getting over a, a breakup. I was like, oh, that sounds bad. And he gave me all the story. I was like, well, what was the worst part? He goes, oh, OK, well, the actual worst part was on Christmas Eve. Me and my wife were coming back. We had the Christmas presents. Our parents, her, my, her parents and my parents were in the house with our three children. We're about to go in. And she goes, Stephen, it's not called Stephen. Stephen, before we go in, I just want to tell you, I have been cheating on you for the last six months with your best man at your wedding. Um, after Christmas, I will be moving out and moving in with him. But let's not tell the kids or our parents, let's not ruin Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very considerate of her. <laughs> so it did ruin Christmas, believe me. That was the worst bit about the actual whole thing. Once we worked on that, he found it quite funny. So what I want you to do, I want you to get this. I want you to work with somebody who looks like they've got massive problems and say, do you have a negative memory that you want to work on? Give it a name. Is it a picture or a movie? Is it subject or objective? How clear and focused is it? Out of 10, how strong is that emotion? Write that down. Go, go, go. You have two minutes either way. Uh, which is blackout? Oh, that's not blackout. That's blackout. I have a glamorous assistant right here. This is my friend Dan. Dan, who wears children's clothing. So this is Dan. Now, I'm going to show you. You don't pay VAT. <laughs> OK. No, I've known Dan for a long time. It's cool guy. Um, and Dan's your cameraman for today. So I'm going to show you what the process now is. Now, there's not much going on, but there is a lot going on. And to actually get it right does take practice. OK? So what you want to do is you want to get the person playing the role of client or victim to actually be sat down. <laughs> not victim. Because the thing is, if you're trying to do eye movements with somebody who's much shorter than you, you look daft, right? So you want to get the person sat down, and you want to actually do it stood up to them. You want to get your fingers about a foot and a half, two foot away from their eyes. And you want to be lining up with the bridge of their nose, OK? You get them to hold the memory. So go close your eyes. Hold on to this memory. Steve's house. What that happened or whatever. Hold on to that memory. You are then going to move them in three ways. I'll show you. You're going to move them. They are not my eyes. That's model zone. OK, so you're going to move them. 666, mark of the beast. You're going to move them six times in this direction. That is one. Not one, two. One. You'll all get it wrong. Don't worry. All right? <laughs> one, two. And you do all that way up to six. I will do six. I'm just lazy. You then want to move up to the top quadrant and move it down through, crossing the bridge of the nose, six times. And then down to the different quadrants, six times. Now, you only need to... Sorry, I'm just kicking you there. You only need to get to go their eyes to the periphery of their vision. You don't need to go... <laughs> it's not needed. <laughs> so you want to do this. Now, you want to be doing it like you're doing it against a flat panel of glass. You don't want to introduce distance, because some people will be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm not going to hit you. Calm down, Dan. I get a bit dizzy, well, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> don't. Right, I just don't. Right. So you want to get here. You want to move at that kind of speed. Any slow is too boring. Any fast is too confusing. So you want to go about six. And you're challenging, you're challenging them to hold on to that memory. And they'll go, it's confusing. Go, I know. <laughs> hold on to that memory. I can't. Keep doing it. Right, And you keep challenging them to hold on to the memory. Then afterwards, you ask them what it's like. You recalibrate. So you do it six times, and then you ask them what it is like. I'll put the instructions up, don't worry. So the important thing is, IMT works because of two things. It works because you're moving their eyes whilst holding onto the memory. This is not moving somebody's eyes. This is moving somebody's head. <laughs> and it won't work. So you, get, you have to get them to hold on to the memory, challenge them to hold on to the memory, keep using the label, whilst moving their fingers and move all around the room, got the whole space of the room, move anywhere to do it, get comfortable, 
get them to hold the memory and move their eyes. Does this make sense? It should take two or three minutes either way. So I want you to do it obviously back and forth. Big round of applause for my beautiful assistant, Dan. Woo! Take a bow, Dan. Take a bow. Go, 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 go. Well done, well done. Two or three minutes either way. Go, go, go. How are we? Weird, isn't it? If it makes you feel any better, I've been in this position working with clients and them experiencing this thousands and thousands of times. I'm going to go through some of the predictable outcomes that we tend to get by doing this process. What I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes, or close your eyes, and if I mention something that resonates with you, lift your arm and keep it in the air. So close your eyes and think about the memory. Put your hand up if that memory is now harder to retrieve, so harder to get back. Excellent. Uh, movies turn into pictures or pictures get broken up. Movies get broken up. Keep your hands up. Pictures are hard to get or it just seems faded out and more blurry. The memory seems further away. The emotional level, so the out of 10 drops and the memory loses significance. Keep your hands up and open your eyes and look around the room. That's about a 95% success rate. I know it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> What is this trick, magic man? <laughs> OK. <laughs> it takes about 20 minutes to what we call globalize. Now, for those of you who didn't get the best results, it's probably because of one of two reasons. One, you were not holding on to the memory, or two, your eyes weren't moving. When I actually teach this in groups of about 12, 14, I go around and I'm actually observing everybody to make sure you do it. It takes practice, both as the clinician and as the client. It takes practice to actually get into this. We're going to do it again, but on a different memory. Now, I want you to remember this first memory that we've worked on, memory one, because we are going to come back to it at the end and see how it is. It takes about 20 minutes to globalize, basically to work with it all the way throughout the brain regions. It takes about 20 minutes to do so. So exercise two, we're going to call memory two. I want you to work with somebody else this time. I want you to do the exact same exercise, so get a label, ask them if it's a picture or a movie. I want you to move their eyes, recalibrate, but then I want you to do a second cycle. So basically do the movement six times and then say, what's it like now? And recalibrate and then go, OK, close your eyes, hold the memory to what you have now and simply do it again. And then recalibrate. Does that make sense? OK, so find somebody who looks like they've got lots of problems. You've got two or three minutes either way. Go, 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 go. Cool. How are we doing? Dizzy, confused, <laughs> don't know what's going on, why didn't I know about this years ago kind of thing, yeah? Yeah. I think this should be taught in schools. I really do. I'm not going to go into schools, I'm scared of kids. But I think this should be taught in schools. Close your eyes for me. Oh dear, I've broken that. I want you to think of the memory that we worked on first, memory one. So not the one you've just done, the one we did previous. Now a lot of people will be thinking, what was that memory? <laughs> the first memory you worked on, is it harder to get back now? Yeah. Does it feel more distant? I feel like a preacher. <laughs> Does it feel more distant? <laughs> Say hallelujah. <laughs> Does it seem less significant? Do you see the benefits of doing this with negative memories and experiences? And also, what people often report is not only does it look and seem different, they get a different understanding of what happened. Sometimes it's like, do you know what? It wasn't really about me. So sometimes you get a real different understanding of what actually happened. So again, think of the memory you've just worked on now. And again, just keep your hands up. Just put your hands up in the air, right? You just don't care. If, wait a minute, whoa, 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 eager people. Whoa, easy, easy. So with the memory you've just worked on now, please put your hands in the air like you just don't care. If that memory is harder to retrieve, if those pictures are harder to at least broken up or if the film's broken up, if the pictures seem harder to get or if they're faded out, if that memory seems further away, if the emotional level has dropped or if the memory loses significance, just open your eyes, look around you. That is what I call a very successful technique and result. To say that you're doing this for the first time 
in a group of 200, not under supervision. This is why I love this type of therapy. We haven't talked about what happened, yet you're still able to work on it. So a lot of the people I work with are guys who have been physically and sexually abused, and they don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to ruin my day. So the way you're able to work with people by doing this, you don't need to talk about the memory. You can just call it the situation. Having fun? Yeah. Yes, somebody is surprised. I'm having more fun than I thought I was going to. Okay. We're going to move this on a little bit. Uh, basically, because this is basically, I'm able to teach you hour one of basically like a weekend, but I'm going to give you as much as I can. Um, IMT works in two ways. It works on memory and it works on identity. So it works on memory, how did I learn how to feel this way? And identity is how did I learn how to be this way? So two-day training, I'm not selling anything, by the way. I don't have a course to sell. If you want info about it, I'll give it to you, but I don't have anything to like, and now, you just need to sign now. I don't have a course to sell. I should do, but I don't, right? I'm not very good at sales marketing like that. So... Um, but this is sort of all day one kind of stuff. It gets much more. So basically, it's in two days is the actual chain. All day one is about direct memory, and all day two is about being and your actual identity, because it works with different eye patterns and different movements. But I want to show you a way of finding the initial sensitizing event. How did you first learn how to feel a certain way? We're going to do some regression. Tell me about your childhood. <laughs> OK? IEMT does not work on emotion. It doesn't work on emotion. It does work on basically the ISE, which is the initial sensitizing event, and that's what you actually do the process on. Emotion is generated because of memory. So we're actually going to go back to the memory that's generating this emotion. And we do this for anticipatory events, interviews, dates, or anything, or an emotion that you actually have at the moment that you just don't want. Just could be general sadness, anger. Or you might have something that's coming up that you want to work on. Something you've got coming up that you don't necessarily want to do. You might have to have a chat with a flatmate that you don't want to. You might have an interview coming up. You might have a date coming up. You might be going back to see family members that you don't necessarily get on with. If you've got something coming up, the reason why you'll feel anxiety, or whatever it might be, is because of past experience with this. So what we do is we use that emotion to go back to the beginning. Basically with pulp, remember the first time. It's a very niche joke, isn't it? Right? So this is the exercise. With a partner, I want you to say, do you have an upcoming event that you're anxious or concerned about? Or do you have an emotion that you have on a daily or a consistent basis that you want to minimise? Step two. When you think of the emotion, out of 10, how strong is it? Zero being no connection, 10 being overwhelm. How familiar is this feeling? Oh, yeah, I know this feeling. And when's the first time you can remember feeling this way? Now, I'll give you some tips on this. It's very, the context is usually not the same as what you're thinking. So if you're going for a job interview and you're anxious and you think, well, why am I anxious? Because I'm fear of being judged or whatever. OK, so you have this feeling. It might be an eight. Well, when's the first time? It probably wasn't a job interview. It was probably something that happened at school. It probably goes all the way back to then. So you simply tune in. This is about as spiritual as I get. You tune into it like a radio wave. Oh, I hate it. And you go back to the beginning, to the first time you can remember feeling this way. And then... I don't think so. <laughs> and our guest speaker for today. <laughs> no, I'm, I, we're, no, I'm sorry, I don't think so. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was on a roll then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to traumatise anyone. <laughs> but I like your thinking. So what we're going to do... <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> You say to somebody, do you have something coming up that you're feeling anxious about or fearful about? Or do you just have an emotion, which, like anger or whatever it might be? And they'll go, yes. And they'll go, how familiar is that feeling? No, you don't rate that. You just want, them, you just want compliance to go, yeah, I know it well. It's not like I'm feeling it for the first time. I've felt it before, essentially. 
And when's the first time you can remember feeling that way? And get them to go all the way back and they'll probably go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The first time will tend to be clear and concise. At that point, you ask them to hold the memory. Don't do any calibration at this point. Get them to hold that first memory and then move their eyes six times like we've already done. And then we recalibrate and ask them how they feel about the, either the feeling or the event coming up. I'll go through it again because we've got lots going on here. Do you have an upcoming event you're anxious or concerned about? Or do you have a feeling that you want to minimise? Ask them how strong the feeling is out of 10. Not what the feeling is, just to the strength of the feeling. How familiar is that feeling? And when's the first time you can remember feeling that way? Regress them back to the initial sensitizing event to the first time it happened. Get them to hold that memory, then move their eyes. If they can't find the initial sensitizing event, a good question to ask is, when's the first time you can remember somebody else feeling that way? So if they can't remember the first time they can feel this way, ask them the first time they can remember somebody else feeling this way. And then hold that memory, move their eyes. Any questions? OK, you have three minutes, 22 seconds either way. Go, go, go. Are we all doing? Heads totally screwed? OK, so the results of this, the results we're going for, is now when you're thinking about the upcoming event, it should seem less scary. It should seem more manageable. My mic's not working. Oh. Is it? If, all right, should we just turn that off then? Can people not hear me? Or just. Is that better? Yeah. All right, that doesn't work then. All right, okay. So I'll go through that again. So basically, when you're thinking about the upcoming event, it should seem less scary, more manageable. And the most important thing, it puts you in a position of control where you think about what you can do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what we're going for. And the thing should seem less overwhelming. And that's the thing. People want to feel super confident about stuff. And that doesn't get you anywhere, because that's driving up, pumping up emotion, and you don't plan if something goes wrong. So if something does go wrong, it will really go wrong. The higher you go, the lower you tend to fall. With this, it just begins to remove the obstacles. So when, when I work with a client, it might be like they have something coming up, and it might start, they think of it, and it's level 9 out of 10. We regress that to that emotion, or to that memory. We then work on that memory. To take this further, you then come back to the original problem and say, when you think of it now, how strong is it? Oh, it's a five. What we then do to continue this practice, we're not going to do this today, we don't have time. We then get the second imprint. So that's what we call the actual ISE. So we get the level five and we go back to how they've begun to feel that way. And we start to untangle it like a knot. Now, sometimes negative memories will pop up that are really vivid and that will tend to happen. But if that does happen, then you simply get them to hold that memory and then actually work on it like that. Do the six pointer on that particular memory. So when I'm working with a client, I'm extracting all of these emotions and memories and I'm working on them in those two different ways. I'm either regressing them back to get to the memory or working on the memory directly. The whole point of this is not to make somebody feel great. It's just clearing stuff out. When stuff's cleared out, you feel present. You feel happy. You feel confident, you don't feel overwhelmed, and more importantly, it puts you in a position of control where you can do things. That's the important thing, being able to do stuff. Saying, why does this happen to me, or why do I feel so bad, is really disempowering. The question we want you to get to is, what can I do? I was giving this talk a few weeks ago at Funzing, which is a, an events platform. In fact, you booked on Funzing, I think. Um, now, you can probably say, I do this talk quite regularly if you want to come again <laughs> for some reason, or if you want to tell other people, please do. Um, and it's just called removing negative memories on there. You can read a lot of the feedback and stuff from there. But I had a guy come up who was going for brain surgery, and he was not looking forward to it, to say the least. And I said, when you think about brain surgery, what's it like? He goes, I just, I can't, I just, I, you could barely speak. On stage, we did one cycle of it, and he was with his wife who brought him along because she'd heard about this. When you think about it now, what's it like? It goes, well, 
it's upsetting, but I've got to get my will in order. I've got to get this. And he started listing off the things he had to do with much less of the emotion. Can I do this on myself? Is a question I get asked a lot. <coughs> yes, sort of. First of all, you want to work on yourself. Think through the questions, either for a negative memory or to locate the source. So work on yourself like you're working with a client. Okay? And then you want to hold your jaw whilst you move your eyes. What would be really good to do is to get some thread and on the wall create the six points and actually do it so you're a few feet away and you can do it. Whatever you do, don't do it in a mirror because you will trip yourself out. <laughs> you know how you can't see yourself blink? Well, you can't see your eyes move either. So do not do it in a mirror. The easiest thing to do is to teach this to somebody else and say, look, I've got something I want to work on. I don't need you. How am I going to phrase this? I don't need you to speak to me. I just, I just need to borrow your finger. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty minds at play here. Dirty minds at play. Be careful which friends you ask. Come with this. So you can really work on a lot of problems without talking about what the problems are. You can just get somebody to actually do it for you, which is really, really good, really, really good. And so why I love IMT? Well, I've used lots of different therapy models over the years, and I just love the way that IMT works. I can remember the very first time I experienced it. Um, it was in, uh, a number of years ago now, and I went down. The actual guy, if you want to research this further, is Andrew Austin, who actually created this, Andrew Austin. And you'll find lots of stuff on YouTube. You'll find lots just Andrew Austin. You'll, you'll find lots of stuff. I'll, I'll send some stuff out as well if you subscribe. And um, I was working as a hypnotherapist. And somebody said to me, do you want to come and see this guy do a talk? It's about this new thing called IEMT or something. It's about memories. And I went, uh, yeah, why not? So I went down, went into this little workshop. This was before it was even a training. It was just like an experimental thing. And he goes, OK, I want you to think of a memory from a long time ago that annoys you. And I was like, I've got one. And then somebody did this. And it was at that moment I realized not how much I'm changing as a person, but how much this is going to change what I do. I realized this technique doesn't work for everybody all of the time. It works for a lot of the people a lot of the time. I realized then, it was that moment, I realized the power and the efficiency and the brilliance of this simple but beautiful and elegant technique and the potential it really, really has. And I was like, that memory, ooh, where's it, ooh. I was like, you are today, just like, what, what, what's going on, right? Since then, I've learned so much about it. I've used it on thousands of people. And now, I want to teach it to as many people as I can. We're going through interesting times in the world at the moment. And I definitely think by learning these kind of skills, we can make huge improvements. Rather than overreacting and being emotional to things, we can become more rational and considered and make better decisions. We don't need to have all these horrible memories in our head. We are not saying something didn't happen. We're not saying that. We're just able to stop the suffering that you're experiencing now. My clients often say it's like doing hundreds of hours of therapy, but in seconds. And it's content free, which you don't talk about it. It works with most of the people most of the time. I think we, we don't have a working microphone. I'll, I'll answer some questions which I know we already have about some things. How long does it last is always the first one. I don't know. If you go on my YouTube, hello. No, the microphone broke. We've already tried it. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> so if you go on my YouTube, RWH Matt Kendall, been busy on this stage today, haven't you? RWH Matt Kendall. I'll also send you the links as well. I do interviews with people about three to six months after I've worked with them. I usually see people for two sessions, a week apart. Often, at the second session, the client doesn't know why they're there. Because they're like, but why is this a problem? I don't know. You came to me. I've often had to send their client form back to them, and they sometimes swear they didn't write it. It's really weird. Sometimes I might just get me mixed up. No, but the, because it feel, the, the feeling is so natural. And people, this is the thing. This is the thing, right? People go, how can I do this? And this feeling or this emotion is stopped in a couple of seconds. 
for something I've had for 10, 20, 30 years. Well, think of it like this. The thing that caused it also happened in a few seconds. So how long does it last? I don't know. But the thing is, close your eyes for me. I want you to think about memory one. So the first memory did with IMT. And just notice how far and distant that really is now. And just try and bring it back and see what happens. Some of you won't even know what that memory is. So think about the second memory that you worked on, memory two. And just think about that. Again, just try and bring it back and see what happens. Allow your eyes to open. So I work with people, again, I'm not looking for clients by any means here, to be honest. If you do want to do any one-to-one -one stuff, the gentleman in the back, Alex, make yourself known. Alex is somebody who I actually trained up as well. He's also studying psychology here at this very fair university. If you're wanting to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, he's the guy to speak to. If you're wanting to do training in this, it's a two-day training, which I'll be giving you details of in a little bit. Um, I'll give you how to subscribe and get the information on it. But I'm not really looking for clients, to be honest, because I do, I'm more effective doing talks than one-on-one -on -one work now, okay? Um, so how long does it last? Again, if you're really determined to screw your life up, which some people are, you can probably undo it. Think of it like this. The decisions are caused by emotion. So if you change your life by, if you work on your emotion and then you do something differently, consciously, you're able to make different decisions because there's less friction soon your life will be on a very different trajectory. You'll be in a different place altogether. So basically, I find this does tend to be a permanent result of particular memories. It's not a fix-all, and it's not a solution for everything. It just seems to be a very effective tool that works on a lot of stuff with a lot of people a lot of the time, and I want a lot more people to know about it. So the actual training, I do about two or three a year, for those who want to get into therapy, for those who are already in therapy, so I get a lot of people who do EMDR, and they come and do this as well to compare the two. And there is a paper that's been written on the actual, if you can go to the association of IEMT, it will actually explain, because I'm not trained in EMDR, so I can't give a very good, basically, sort of what it's like, a very good comparison. But I have had several EMDR therapists come and do IEMT, and they say basically it's like a much faster, direct version of EMDR. And those who just want to work on themselves. So if you think about the results you've got for yourself today from doing an hour or so, imagine what you can get over a weekend, okay? So if you want information, well, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've seen some different ideas and how you can use it. And I really want you to take, you, I want you to take this home and actually use it for yourself. Actually use the skills. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want the slides from today, there's two ways of doing it. I've got a, chat, I've got, I've got a messenger chat bot. Go to removenegativememories.com and subscribe there. Go to the email opt-in. It's the same content, removenegativememories.co.uk. And I will send out all the information about how it works, all the neurology behind it, and basically all the stuff that we have on it. I want to, before I go, I want to say a massive thank you to Niall for inviting me here today. I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. See you later. <laughs>